biofuels. If you're in the oil and gas industry, you've probably heard the term already, whether it's making you money or just making your blood boil. And not just because of mandates, they really are their own unique fuel. And figuring out how to successfully incorporate those into our facilities is a huge learning curve on its own. Here's what to expect with your SRU. Welcome to the Experts Network. Hey guys, welcome back to the Experts Network. Today we're talking about how biofeed incorporation and biofuel production affects the SRU. For those of you who don't know, biofuels really refers to any hydrocarbon based fuel that is made from, well, things that rot. So that could be corn, algae, food waste from a local restaurant, municipal waste, waste from a lumber mill nearby. There's so many sources available to make biofuels from, it's really exciting. And one of the reasons why we are focused on this as an industry is because the chemical structure is really similar to traditional fuel sources. It has the hydrocarbon bonds, and it's not something that we're not unfamiliar with. The problem is it's not exactly similar. For example, biofeedstocks have significantly less sulfur in them than trad traditional fuels do. So a traditional feedstock might have about 4% by weight sulfur, whereas a vegetable oil, for example, has less than 0.001 weight percent. All that less sulfur means significantly less H2S going into your SRU. Additionally, biofeeds also have significantly more oxygen in them. So a traditional feed might have about 1% by weight or less than that of oxygen in the molecules, whereas a vegetable oil might have 10 to 11 weight percent. And a pyrolysis oil made from biofeedstocks could have up to 40%. Yeah, four zero. Obviously that oxygen doesn't end up in our fuels. So where does it go? Well, again, it depends on how you are co-processing this, but if you're putting it into a hydro treater, it will typically react with the hydrogen to make water, or it will react with the carbons that break free from the chains as those hydrocarbon chains break apart in the hydro treater. And that would make either CO or more commonly CO2. Now, all that extra water isn't really an issue for the SRU, as long as your amine overhead temperatures and your sour water stripper overhead temperatures are kept at their normal levels. You're pretty good. However, all that extra CO2 is kind of a big deal for the SRU. Now, when we're talking about how much extra CO2 is in the amine acid gas, the rule of thumb seems to be for drop-in hydro treating, where it all goes into the same hydro treater, your amine acid gas should have a 0.65 to 0.8% by mole, uh, molar fraction increase in CO2 per 1% co-processing. What does that mean? So say my amine acid gas normally has about 10% CO2 and I start co-processing 5% biofeed. So 95% traditional fuel, 5% biofeed. That means that my amine acid gas is now going to jump up to about 13 or 14% CO2. Now, again, that's for drop-in hydro treating. There's so many different routes. That's just one aspect, but that's kind of the fraction we're talking about. Now, fortunately, that CO2 does not affect your close reaction, so your catalyst beds are totally fine, no big deal. However, the CO2 doesn't burn. And if we are replacing the H2S in the amine acid gas, that does burn with CO2 that does not burn, you might end up with a colder reaction furnace. If you already have a very rich amine acid gas, like your H2S is above 90%, you probably don't have to worry about this so much. But if you're already running lean, like 60, 40, 20% H2S, you should be a little bit concerned uh, because that's likely going to mean that you will have too cold of a reaction furnace. Uh, what is too cold? Well, that depends on what you are putting into your SRU. If you have an amine acid gas only, then you're probably more worried about BTEX destruction or aromatics, that's specifically benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene. If those escape your reaction furnace and go into your catalyst beds, they will very quickly and irreversibly deactivate your catalyst, and the only way to fix that is to replace the catalyst bed. We don't want that, obviously. Now, if you're, also co or if you're also processing sour water acid gas, then you're more worried about ammonia destruction. Not 
that you're ignoring the VTEX, but ammonia is, destruct is combusted at a higher temperature. So now you're targeting about 1250 Celsius or 2300 Fahrenheit, as opposed to the 1050 Celsius or 1925 Fahrenheit that you would have been for VTEX destruction. Now, some facilities have high ammonia residuals and they have no plugging issues, but the more ammonia you have breaking through the reaction furnace, the more likely you are to form ammonia salts, or at least the more ammonia is available to form those ammonia salts, and those can cause plugging issues in your plant and really cause some backup and some headaches. So the less ammonia breakthrough, the better. Those are your temperature minimums that you should be meeting. If you have all this extra CO2 coming in and maybe less H2S, how do we keep the temperature hot? Well, it depends on how your unit is built. If you have a front side split reaction furnace, where a, part, a portion of the amine acid gas goes around the main burner and comes in the side of the reaction furnace, then you can really just vary the bypass fraction and that should give you the temperature that you need. Now, am I telling you to maximize your temperature and increase your bypass fraction right up to 66% or 80%? Absolutely not. Do not do that. That's a penalty. The reason being is that you have a significant amount of control over that front zone temperature by varying your bypass fraction. If you jump that up too high, you actually risk damaging the refractory there and potentially damaging your burner. Obviously, we don't want that. For most refractory we've seen, the maximum temperature threshold is about 1500 Celsius or 2700 Fahrenheit, but be sure to talk to your vendor to know exactly what your unit needs. One of the other things to consider with this is the greater acid gas bypass you have, the more gas you have going around the main burner, and you've effectively reduced the residence time of that gas because it's coming in about halfway through the entire vessel. That means that you might be more likely to get greater BTEX, greater ammonia breakthrough, which we obviously don't want. So making sure that you don't have those contaminants breaking through, which is super easy with on-site testing, or, and making sure that your front and rear zone temperatures are nice and hot is critical to figuring out where your new bypass set point should be. Maybe you don't have a bypass system. Maybe you have a straight through reaction furnace, or maybe you do have a bypass system, but your valve is frozen or your flow meter is unreliable and you don't really know where you're at. We still have options for you. First, you can take a look at co-firing and that's essentially where you would put a different fuel gas in to burn in the main burner along with your amine acid gas and sour water super acid gas. You want to make sure that if you do this, you're using a gas of constant composition because the main factor to consider with this is a steady air to fuel gas ratio or burn stoichiometry. If you throw in a fuel gas that has a composition going like this, you never know what you're gonna get because you might be putting too much air to combust it and resulting in free oxygen slipping through and lighting your downstream beds on fire big problems. Or you might not be putting enough oxygen in and now you end up with soot coming through and collecting on your beds resulting in plugging issues. Or you might end up with again aromatics or hydrocarbons coming in and even just straight chain hydrocarbons over time will deactivate your catalyst. So again constant composition know where you're at. How you can dial in to that air and fuel gas rate air to fuel gas ratio is just through doing oxygen and soot testing as close to the downs the outlet of the reaction furnace as possible usually around the condenser one outlet is where we like to see those tests done and that makes sure that you're operating at a good ratio even if your flow meters aren't working great keep in mind that adding this extra fuel gas as well as the combustion air required to burn it results in greater volume through your unit. So make sure that your unit is able to handle that extra capacity. You also want to make sure that your burner can handle it. Sometimes you might have a burner that's just not built to constantly co-fire and that's okay, but don't co-fire with it. <laughs> Maybe your design is actually good, you're able to do it just perfectly, but keep in mind that some areas might have increased regulations around CO2 emissions and doing that extra co-firing is not really an option for you anymore. So make sure to check your local regulations as well.
Maybe oxygen enrichment is the way that you'd like to go instead of co-firing. The mentality behind oxygen enrichment is to remove the excess nitrogen coming in with all of the combustion air. It's just coming in and not really doing anything and taking up space. So if we put pure oxygen in, then we lower the volume, but maintain the same exotherm across the reaction furnace, and we get a higher temperature, which is awesome. Now, keep in mind that I did say you're lowering the volume, so you're effectively operating in a turn down condition. Make sure that you're able to handle that, your burner is able to handle that, the rest of your unit is good. You also want to consider how high of oxygen enrichment you might want to go. That could be low, medium, or high, depending on how much oxygen you want to put in. The higher you go, the hotter your reaction furnace temperature will be, but you also start getting into higher capital cost, higher operating costs because you have more oxygen coming in and you have to start looking at specialized technologies to deal with those really high temperatures. One of the final options you might consider is to install preheaters on your feed gases, specifically the amine acid gas and the combustion air. Now, these have a bit higher capital cost and a bit higher operating cost potentially, um, and they don't increase the reaction furnace temperature by that much compared to co-firing and oxygen enrichment, but there's a lot of facilities that have these uh, preheaters on the feed gases and they work very well, they're very happy with them, so that might be an option that you could consider as well. So the CO2 really only affects the reaction furnace, and we have discussed how to keep that nice and hot, but it doesn't really affect the Klaus reaction across the Klaus converters. It also doesn't really affect any sub-dew point TGTUs or direct oxidation technology TGTUs. It does, however, affect amine-based TGTUs like Scott-type technologies. The reason for this is all that CO2 can potentially react with the amine and recycle back around to the reaction furnace front, which again, we just discussed, we don't want it there. The way that you maximize CO2 slip, meaning the amount of CO2 that slips through the amine absorber and goes out your stack, is by potentially switching to a selective amine, like MDEA. There's a couple options on the market and you can consider what would work best for your unit. You can also consider changing the amine strength or adjusting the circulation rate. The more contact time between the amine and all that extra CO2, the more CO2 is going to be picked up and recycled. So optimizing that circulation rate is a very critical factor. I can't really tell you what your set points should be or where they should be for this because each facility is unique and we want to make sure that you get the results that work best for your unit. But we're happy to lend a hand if you need. Again, biofuels are a very exciting and a little nerve wracking change in the industry and they have their own learning curve. They're going to have some growing pains as we try to figure out how to bring those online. However, at least in terms of the SRU, it's nothing we haven't seen before and know how to overcome. With these tools, you should be able to successfully keep your SRU running while you co-process. And if you run into problems, we're still here, happy to be your lifeline. If you like the video, like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell, all the things that YouTube tells you to do nowadays. Um, but really, we would love to hear your stories about if you're co-processing or considering it, what challenges you're running into, uh, what issues you faced, or what successes you had. Or alternatively, if you just have questions about anything else regarding SRUs, we're your people. Thanks for listening, you guys.